to the stage, a good good friend of mine, um, Augustus <laughs> Augustus Frank, who is a neuroscientist, would you believe? Woo! Frank, I am a scientist and a man. <laughs> I assume most of you are here because you read my ad in the Galway Independent. <laughs> For those of you who are here by chance, uh, explorers wanted for dangerous and unusual expedition. Must be flexible. That is physically flexible. You will have to, however, take a large chunk out of your calendar, possibly two months to your entire life, depending on how the expedition goes. Wages, possibly irrelevant due to high mortality rate of previous <laughs> missions. But survivors will be reimbursed for breakfast and lunch, not dinners, upon production of receipts. Long months of complete discomfort guaranteed. Science background preferred. No women. <laughs> it's nice to see some of you brought your wives out for, <laughs> for a night out this evening. Meet at 8 o'clock at the Roisin Dove. Sincerely, Dr. Augustus Frank Hackington. Brextopia. <laughs> I'm sorry about the delay. I did not realize the room was going to be bucked up with so many um, performers. <laughs> so let me begin my presentation of the expedition, and you can get an idea of what you're in, you're in store for. I must say I am happy to see so many eager faces. <laughs> For those of you who are not familiar, <laughs> I am Augustus Frank, neuroscientist, uh, son of the great and vastly wealthy Reginald Theodore Frank, who invented the concept of rust. <laughs> and wife, Lady Margarita Frank, his loyal lab assistant. Uh, my mother was Australian German and my father was English French, which goes some ways to explaining what exactly my accent is all about. <laughs> but we don't need to bring that up again. I am here today to recruit explorers for a very special exhibition. I've always been of the philosophy, whether or not you think it's physically possible or you think it's not physically possible, doesn't matter as long as you have enough money. <laughs> and I may have mentioned I am very, very wealthy. <laughs> so. To begin, I'm going to tell you a bit about my scientific background, and then I shall detail the nature of the exhibition. Expedition. <laughs> yeah. So, I started my research in neuroscience by attempting to recreate a brain from scratch. In order to do so, I had to mutate live neurons. And uh, unable to find a living human subject, I had to use the brains of several squids. Um, so, now what resulted uh, was over a decade's worth of the measurement of squid brainwave patterns. Yes. 
I interpreted the electrochemistry of squid brains to such precise detail that I could read the visualization of their patterns as an almost written language, which I translated through my special squid robot, which I also designed to look like a squid. <laughs> the only problem, however, is that the pattern of brain waves inside a squid's head are rather repetitive. <laughs> uh, and once I had identified the code of the squid brain language, its communications boil down to three main expressions. I shall now play a, a recording of the squid robot and its three main expressions. If you just give me a moment. Okay, expression one. Oh, hang on. <laughs> I want to eat some fish. <laughs> Expression one. Expression two. I want to squirt ink on whatever's stopping me from eating fish. <laughs> Expression three. Ah, uh, I'm pooping out the fish now. <laughs> And in one singular freak incident of self-awareness, the squid uttered this. Wait, but I'm a fish. Ark, what the fuck? And I eat other fish. That's messed up. I am, of course, translating into my own rough approximation of the register and formality of the thought I believe the squid to be portraying. But this particular squid, despite the uniqueness of its thought, was foolishly mistaken in its classification of its own genus. <laughs> squid are not, in fact, fish. <laughs> uh, sadly, however, for squid, the only word squid seem to be able to grasp in order to identify uh, another living thing is that of the word fish. If a squid were to see you in the water, for example, it would probably think, oh my, what an ugly fish. <laughs> <clears throat> so some of you may have been wondering where I've been for the last 10 years, those of you who are familiar with my research. <laughs> I have been developing a shrinking device powerful enough to allow a human to become small enough to pass unimpeded into our very cells. So some of you may be thinking, of course, why didn't I just make an enlarging machine and blow up the neurons so we could see them in a visible size? Uh, then we could avoid all this expedition malarkey and it would overall be a lot less strenuous. Well, I really rather wish you'd made that suggestion sooner because <laughs> I was nine years into making the bloody shrinking machine before I thought of that myself. <laughs> and I was nearly finished at that point, so. Um, so, let me explain a bit about the journey. Where are my diagrams? Oh, thank you. Right, so, oh, thank you. Thank you, fish. <laughs> <laughs> so, what will happen is, I will shrink a small group of explorers inside of an ice cream van. <laughs> That's you, one shrunk. We will isolate a part of my brain and enter. The part, incidentally, I've decided to isolate is the part I have identified as the least used in my own brain, which is the right supermarginal gyrus, which incidentally controls egocentrism and empathy, funnily enough. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> We're going in an ice cream van because we will need to brain freeze that aspect of the brain in order to avoid electromagnetic uh, communication. Uh, so what I want to do is shrink a team of explorers and essentially get them to go inside and take a picture of a neuron on a single cellular level. Now, are there any questions? <laughs> well. I'll be sitting at the back if you are interested in signing up. I need a team of six. I'll reiterate, no women. <laughs> uh, and thank you very much for coming out. Thank you.